began to preach. And I'll tell you, the Holy Ghost began to fall. Hallelujah. And there were people who came running to give their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Naked Pentecostalism. I'm your host, Isaac Coverstone. Today we're going to go over the bite model. This is uh, from psychologist Stephen Hassan. And it is a method of objectively determining the scoring for how how severe that the organization that you're in uh, ranks as far as whether it's a cult or not. It's a method of looking at some very common characteristics of cults and trying to trying to be unbiased about it. Just you know, here's some categories and see how things match up. And it's very it's very neutral. Anybody can use this for any organization they're a part of. And certainly if you're a member of a church and some of these apply to you, it's it's a little bit uh, it's up to you to decide how we want to do with that, but at least you know where you stand. So without any further delay, let's get right into it. So the bite model is for uh, categories for your uh, your life, so to speak. It stands for behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. So it's you know B I T E, and this can be found on uh, freedomofmind.com. It's very easy to look up just bite model, and find that anywhere on Google. So going to category one, behavior control. There's a list of of um, categories. There's a category and there's a list of questions. And so let's go down the list. Regulate individuals' physical reality. Now this is a little tricky one. I, I think some people maybe wouldn't understand how that applies. Uh, regulate the individual's physical reality. This could be a matter of determining when you wake up, when you go to sleep, more or less regulating your life and your your pacing, your schedule. You know, I'm not going to say that I'm certain that the church has any involvement in that. I'm just going to put a question mark. Uh, you could make that argument, but I think it's a little bit of a stretch. Category two, determine where, how, with whom the member lives, associates, or isolates. Now, this is definitely going to be checked. They do frequently try to control people that, uh, say, for example, a child or a teenager lives with a parent that's outside of the church. They will make an effort to get that child out of that home into their own apartment, get them somewhere where they're away from that family member. Obviously, there's only so much you can do with minors, but if you're any kind of a young adult or you're graduated from high school, they will pressure you to get out on your own so that they can control your life to some degree much more simply without other influences. And I've seen this happen multiple times. Um, And of course, it's worse when a parent leaves the church. Um, Then they will try and get the family members to get away from that family member. So it goes in the opposite direction as well. Number three, when, how, with whom the member has sex. This is pretty typical for Christian churches, but more so with the strict group I was a part of. Really, it's about, you know, homosexuality is completely forbidden. Well, there's there's strike one right there. To some degree, they control this in terms of there's a lot of shaming, sexual shaming with um, teenagers especially, but it can apply to any age group. And they want everyone to follow certain guidelines. And it's just, um, yeah, I think they definitely fall into this category. Option four is to control types of clothing and hairstyles. Again, huge part of certain apostolic Pentecostal churches, certainly UPC churches, and more so the church I was a part of. They tell you exactly what kind of clothes you're going to wear. You are never allowed to wear shorts, you know, male or female. You can't wear shorts. You can't wear short sleeve shirts. All your sleeves have to be below the elbow, essentially. And hairstyles, yeah, they'll chew the guys out if your sideburns are too long. If you have 
a weird style, too much gel in it, you'll get made fun of. You know, women need to wear their hair up in a nice decorative style. It's frequently harped on. Uh, number five, regulate diet. Food and drink, hunger, and or fasting. You know, I can't say that this applies. So they do occasionally ask people to fast for a couple of days, but it's very voluntary. Um, they don't really care about what you eat necessarily. That would be more on the Jewish side of things or a Muslim side of things. But yeah, they really don't care much one way or the other. So that's negative on that. Six, manipulation and deprivation of sleep. Can't say that's ever happened, to my knowledge. Uh, there's not really a, a reason, a purpose for that, so I will say negative on that. Number seven, financial exploitation, manipulation, or dependence. Now, this is absolutely a red flag. This is something I've seen personally. They required a minimum 10% of your gross income before taxes. So in other words, you got a family of, you know, a man and a woman, a couple of kids, and they're taking home 900 bucks a week, that 90 bucks is going straight to the church, just right off the top. And then they get taxes and social security taken out of that and everything else. And so I have seen families literally lose their apartment or their house and have to move in with their parents. They can't pay for their rent or their mortgage, but they're still handing over their money to the church. And that's definitely financial exploitation. And so that's, yeah, huge check mark. Number eight, restrict leisure, entertainment, vacation time. I have seen, I've, I've heard messages preached over the pulpit where they said, you know, you shouldn't be spending time away from church or don't schedule your vacation time to get the maximum amount of time away from church. So, you know, as far as leisure entertainment, they're more trying to restrict what you do in your leisure entertainment time. And they certainly do say if you've got free time, you should be spending it on outreach and talking to bus kids and, you know, contributing to the church. I'm going to say that qualifies. It's kind of a it's kind of an iffy one, but I, I think they do it enough that it uh, determines a check mark. Number nine, major time spent with group indoctrination and rituals and or self-indoctrination, including the internet. Yes, there's a great deal of encouragement to do Bible studies, to get small groups together, talk about the doctrine, talk about how to help other people understand it and grasp it. And so it's very much something that they they pressure and encourage. Certainly, we were in service Thursday nights and Sunday morning, Sunday night. Three services a week is a good chunk of time right there, but as well as um, encouraging side projects, so to speak. I would, I would definitely say a yes there. Number 10, permission required for major decisions. Again, huge red flag. Directing someone's life, behavior control, they're going to ask you to run all your major decisions past the management, leadership, authority, whoever, what do you want to call them? And so in the church I was a part of, if you wanted to get married, if you wanted to go on a date, if you wanted to buy a house, if you wanted to whatever, any major decisions, you just wanted to talk to the elders, so to speak. Uh, pastor, bishop, whoever. It was very much run everything by them if possible. And so, yes, I'm going to put a check mark in that category. And number 11, thoughts, feelings, activities of yourself or others reported to superiors. Yes, again, that's, you got to put a check mark there. It was, in fact, encouraged for people to talk to their parents or the uh, private school teachers or other authorities, if another person was reported to be um, in the process of sinning, they're 
watching TV at some point, if they're watching a movie, and you caught them doing that. If they were putting on makeup in the store, you're a girl and you're out at the mall, and your your friend's trying on pants, you were highly, highly encouraged to report that to the superiors and help them from slipping into a lifestyle of sin. So yeah, it was we were all the Gestapo reporting on our fellows. It was kind of a you had an atmosphere where we don't really trust each other and it's it's damaging socially to have that, but that's how it was. Check mark there. Number twelve rewards and punishments used to modify behaviors, both negative and positive. Not a hundred percent sure on this one. You could make the argument that the heaven and hell theology is a type of the reward punishment to modify behaviors, but I think they're trying to apply something in this sense. It's meant to be in this life, not the future. So I put a question mark here. I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that this was something that applies and some people may some people may make an argument that was something they did i can't say that i witnessed that so we're going to pass on that 13 discourage individualism encourage groupthink sure i'll i'll go with that they definitely encourage people to stick with the doctrine that is espoused by the leadership. So if you have your own ideas about how you think things ought to be done, if there's any ideas on doctrine and whatnot, you know, you had to toe the line. There really was not a lot of flexibility given with differing opinions that was even remotely outside that that group. They would have, there was evidence of that with their relationship with other churches. You know, if another church had just a slight difference in doctrine, they didn't talk to them or they had limited contact or, you know, it was just treated totally differently because they were slightly different. So very rigorous process and um, that definitely applies, I think. 14, impose rigid rules and regulations. Big old check mark there. Uh, no drinking, no smoking, no drugs, no TV, no movies, no rock music, no metal music. You know, the list just went on. Uh, in addition to show up every time we have service and pay your tithes and offerings, don't use swear words. I mean, it, it was just a lifestyle built on a set of rules and regulations. It was completely designed to create this atmosphere where we were all back in 1940s America, you know, it was recreating these golden years of wasp America. So yeah, that's, that's a big check mark. 15 instill dependency and obedience. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's self-explanatory. Definitely what the pastor says goes, and if he says, don't date this person, you were expected not to talk to them again. Um, you were expected to, you know, if you had any problems, you came to church and you talked to them about it. And you asked, you prayed first, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was, um, it was very much toe the line, do what we're told, blah, blah, blah. I'll, I'll give a check mark in that category. 16, threaten harm to family and friends. I cannot say that I've witnessed this or that I've heard any rumors that it occurred. So, no. I'm going to put an X there. It is not a, I don't think that really applies. Number 17. Force individual to rape or be raped. Again, I am not aware of any occasion when that would have happened. And I generally believe that's not something that they would have... Um, I don't believe that's ever occurred that I'm, again, that I'm aware of. So that is something we'll disregard. 18, instill dependency and obedience. It appears they've, um, <laughs> it's listed twice. Okay. So 19, encourage and engage in corporal punishment. 
so literally corporal punishment being physical assault by you know a cane or a stick of some kind um you know that's maybe could apply they certainly encourage parents to spank their kids um it were rare occasions when the faculty of the private school would spank children, but that was pretty rare, at least to my memory. I think I remember it occurring at least once when I was growing up, but so engaging in it, I'm not certain that applies. Encouraging it, yeah, we'll give them a 50% score on that. They They do encourage children to be spanked and uh spare the rod spoil the child that fun bible verse so of the 18 categories here they definitely scored in 12 of them and half points in a couple areas so we'll say 12 and a half for 12 12 and a half out of 18 and that's you know uh that's a good score I mean, two-thirds of the way there essentially for behavior control so, let's move on to the next model, and that is I, information control. So, the first category, information control, is deception. That is, to deliberately withheld inf withhold information or um, distort information to make it more acceptable or also to systematically lie to the cult member. Now, in this category, I think they can definitely get a check mark. It was um, fairly common practice in the cult to to only tell half the story, you know, especially when it came to doctrine. Now, again, that's a little bit subjective, but they certainly made it sound like, you know, their theology was the best, and their theology was the only one that's accurate, et cetera, et cetera. And they definitely made an attempt to keep us in the dark when it comes to opposition to that particular doctrine or different theologies and so yeah i i think i can um i can definitely lean towards a check mark there especially the amount of control they put on who's on the internet and how much internet you got that falls under withholding information in my opinion now number two is a little bit more down the line minimize or discourage access to non-cult sources of information, including internet, TV, radio books, articles, newspapers, magazines, other media. Um, minimize access to former members. Keep members busy so they don't have time to think and investigate. And control through cell phone with texting, calls, internet tracking. And this is a big check mark. They definitely forbid people to get on even watch television of any kind they discourage reading certain books and some members were told not to subscribe to certain newspapers or magazines because they were um perhaps they had a negative viewpoint on the cult um they definitely had a very dim view of people speaking to um former members that is those that had left at some point um they encourage the installation of nanny software on people's computers so that if you're on the internet, it reports back to the pastor, gives you a whole, you know, the accountability, so to speak. And yeah, totally, totally right up their alley. Uh, it's a big check mark there. Number three, compartmentalize information into outsider versus insider doctrines. Ensure that information is not freely accessible. Control information at different levels and missions within the group. Allow only leadership to decide who needs to know what and when. And yes, I think that's certainly something that they, we, can, uh, we can say is what happened. They definitely had a practice of... Um, putting themselves out as having the only acceptable truth. They had the the only real revelation of uh, the interpretation of the Bible. Now, I wouldn't say that there was different levels within the group. Um, there was certain people that perhaps had more trust to get 
um, the good information, so to speak. But for the most part, everyone was on the same level. Um, you had access to the same information. It was just the information itself was distorted. Now, leadership deciding who needs to know what and when. Yeah, um, they certainly discourage people from going to college, from getting out and experiencing the greater world. And there was definitely a mindset of we're the good guys, everybody outside these walls, you can't trust them. You know, it was us versus them, tribalism to the hilt. And yeah, information not being freely accessible, sure. Uh, that's completely right up the alley. I would say let's go, it's be safe to put a check mark in that category. Four, encourage spying on other members, uh, imposing a buddy system to monitor and control the member, reporting deviant thoughts, feelings, and actions to leadership, ensure that individual behavior is monitored by the group. I think this kind of falls into, um, it also falls into the behavior category, which already discussed this. Um, yeah, if you noticed your your friend is not doing something quite the way you think they should, yeah, you were expected to report on them. You were expected to confess your deepest faults to leadership and try and seek help for any issues that you had and you didn't know how to deal with. So, sure, yeah, spying on members, yeah, yeah, I think that's more than adequate for what they what they did. Number five, extensive use of cult-generated information and propaganda. Newsletters, magazines, journals, audio tapes, YouTube, movies, other media. Misquoting statements, using them out of context from non-cult sources. So, we didn't have a great deal of media that that, that church I came out of really produced. They certainly didn't produce anything uh, with video, but they uh, they had their own what we call a music industry where they recorded all the preaching done and encouraged people to buy a copy of certain messages that they'd heard and had, that they enjoyed and so they could listen to them over and over again. And so that's probably something that would apply. Uh, they did have a tendency to twist information from the outside world, so to speak, and sell it to us in such a way that um, put their own twist on it. But this is probably 50-50. Um, again, they didn't really generate a great deal of their own media. Certainly not written, not much at all for video. It would just be uh, audio tapes and recordings of their own meetings, which is limited use. But, I mean, again, I'll give it a 50-50. Six unethical use of confession, uh, information about sins used to disrupt or dissolve identity boundaries, withholding forgiveness or absolution, manipulation of memory, possible false memories. This is not something that I would say applies, mostly because we didn't have a lot of confession type uh, activities. We had some, but predominantly everyone was expected to deal with that between you and God. There was there was not really a lot of come before the bishop or the pastor and describe everything bad you've done in your life. You know, that it happened. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but not quite as frequent. Um, so I'm going to say no, that was not something that really occurred. So in this category of information control, I would say, you know, five out of six. This is a fairly high. They absolutely did a great job minimizing how much information we had about opposing viewpoints of our doctrine and our ability to learn more about those viewpoints. So we missed a couple categories. We can give even a four and a half out of six or 4.75, but still fairly high score in that area. So we're moving on to the T of bite and that is thought control. And so, number one is require members to internalize the group's doctrine as truth. And that's, yeah, definitely something they did. The subcategories here are adopting the group's map of reality as reality, instill a black and white thinking, decide between good versus evil, organize people into us versus them, insiders versus outsiders. 
Yes, so all this is very much what they did. You were you were really encouraged to believe that their interpretation of scripture was the only correct version. Period. End of story. There's no insinuation at any point that the Baptists are right, that the Catholics are right, the Presbyterians are right. You know, the Muslims are just spewed straight out of hell. It was in this strong atmosphere of we're right, everyone else is wrong. So yes, completely, this is what describes them to a T. Two, change person's name and identity. This happens to some degree. I'm not going to say this is a I'm not going to say this is something that's big. They they had a practice which was when you're baptized, you you became a part of the family of Christ. You were buried with Christ in baptism, blah blah blah. So everyone was brother and sister. It was very common to require people address another brother as brother so and so, sister so and so. You always had to treat them like equals, but you know, leadership, you never address them by their first name. It was always, you know, title and so on. And on. It was it was fairly formal, especially between younger and older. But changing a name and identity, I mean, I think this is more along the lines of some cults that require people to just, you know, adopt a different language and you know, your name would goes from Tom to Muhammad. And so this is kind of a, again, I'm going to say 50-50. Your identity is definitely, they stress, um, you know, you're a child of the king now. You know, you're not a member of the mass. You're a peculiar people. You're you're this called out generation. And so identity is twisted a little bit. But changing your name, eh, no, nah, not so much. So, yeah, 50% on that one. Number three use of loaded language and cliches which constrict knowledge stop critical thoughts reduce complexities into platitudes and buzzwords so yeah i can kind of see how this could be applied uh, they certainly didn't want people to really spend time on the deep issues uh, they did not want you to think about the australians the aborigines that that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ for 2000 years since it's happened you know the people living in the jungles of Brazil that have never heard of Christianity before this kind of critical thinking they're just like you know what that doesn't affect your salvation you'll you'll figure it out when we get to heaven <laughs> if you die and complexity of knowledge was definitely watered down there was a lot of efforts to just kind of make it all into this emotional rush where you really weren't thinking deeply on anything. It was just, hey, this is this is all about the blood and get the blood on you. And and there's this attitude of, yeah, it's a little hard to describe when you're not knee deep in it. Um, but yeah, constricting knowledge, stop critical thinking, reduce complexities. It was very much a, a religion of coded phrases, and, and that's definitely something that I can identify with. You know, when they get up and they start preaching, there were certain things that you just kind of, they were dog whistles. You know, when they said, you know, we don't want to be sending our kids off to college because, you know, they'll be influenced by humanists. And humanist is not a dirty word to most people, but to the church I came out of, it was might as well have been a four-letter word. You know, if you were a socialist, a humanist, a liberal, they just absolutely slammed those concepts. And this kind of loaded language got people in this mentality where they were maybe afraid of certain ideas and concepts. And yeah, it, it's definitely thought control. I, I'll, I'll give them points for that. So we'll put a check mark there. Number four, encourage only good and proper thoughts. Yeah, that's definitely something that we can give them credit for. They made an effort to stress a lot of prayer and meditation with the goal that you were supposed to think right, you know, get your mind out of the gutter and 
guys don't be thinking about undressing the girls and this this concept of again we're trying to get back to 1940s wasp america and the concept of good and proper of course meant you know no swear words and you know don't be thinking about hurting people and killing people just don't be playing video games that are going to be desensitizing you to violence. And there was definitely an effort made to perform this kind of self-censorship within your own head. And I think that's definitely falls in that category. Five hypnotic techniques are used to alter mental states, undermining critical thinking, even to age regress the member. Um, I can't say for for sure this is ever used. Uh, they were not people that really practiced hypnotic techniques. Um, I'm not aware of any efforts to age regress a person mentally. Undermine critical thinking. Yeah, yeah, they've done that. But honestly, this one's kind of a kind of a wash. I'm not gonna put any check marks there. Number six, memories are manipulated, false memories are created. I can't say that this really ever occurred. Um, yeah, memory manipulation, I don't see that really happening. Hypnotism, memory manipulation, I, I'm going to have to toss that out and say, no, I don't think that ever happened. Seven, teaching thought-stopping techniques, which shut down reality testing by stopping negative thoughts and allowing only positive thoughts. These techniques include... Denial, rationalization, justification, wishful thinking, chanting and meditating, praying, speaking in tongues, singing, or humming. This is an interesting idea that certainly was never was never uh, something we understood when you're knee-deep in this religion and this church. But they did a lot of these things. There was a great deal of loud singing, lots of people speaking in tongues. Lots of people chanting and just verbal assault, and audible assault. And really, this creates a, a, a white noise that's just in the back of your head. And you stop really processing what's going on, what's being said. You're in this emotional thrill ride when you're in the middle of that service. And it's hard to describe to people that have never been there and really experienced it. You, you, kind of have to experience it but yeah you you experience the inability to critically evaluate what's going on and what's being said and i actually addressed this in one of my youtube videos where i described part of the process of me getting out was i wore earplugs on a fairly regular basis because it was it was getting to a very high volume level and it was almost a painful amount of noise and so Wearing earplugs allowed me to actually process what was going on, and, and it, it really made a big difference as far as getting me out of that mentality, and I could listen to what was going on, I could process it, and I absolutely, I absolutely did manage to, um, it helped me get out, just honestly wearing earplugs. So, I can say that they don't actively teach thought-stopping techniques, but without maybe without realizing it or maybe they do realize it these techniques are all being used and um to create an ecstatic psychological state which gets people to not process what's going on so that's yeah i'll give them a check mark for this category number eight rejection of rational analysis critical thinking constructive criticism yes uh they were 100 percent not in favor of um, a lot of concepts of science. They were, for the most part, they were young Earth creationists. They thought that the Noah's Ark was a real event. The Earth was created in 6,000 years ago, three days, or six days, 6,000 years ago. Uh, any criticism or rational thought about this process or the science behind it was just rejected out of hand concept of evolution rejected out of hand um any criticism for the doctrine for their theology nope never allowed whatsoever i'll give them a check mark for that one number nine forbid 
critical questions about the leader, doctrine, or policy allowed. Same thing. Um, policies in the private school. Yeah, you couldn't make fun of them, question them, anything. Policies about um, how they handled their money. You know, how they collected the tithes and offerings and where it went. Nope, nope, not allowed. Check mark there. Number 10, labeling alternative belief systems as illegitimate, evil, or not useful. So I think we've covered this already with another category, but yeah, any any other variations of Christianity, any other variations of uh, Pentecostalism, other than what they taught, yeah, 100% labeled as something we're not going to mess with or completely on the other side of the fence, evil. Um, certainly Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Islam, any of those were labeled as flat-out evil. Um, now, just a th quick side note here. I realize not every church has these categories. I am describing the church that I left. And so you may be thinking, oh, that's crazy. Not all churches are like that. I'm aware of that. We're simply focusing on the church that I spent 35 years in. And uh, we'll go from there. So moving on... The last category is emotional control. Oh, so thought control, we're going to give them a score of 8 out of 10. So pretty high in the thought control, honestly. Emotional control is, starting here, topic 1, manipulate and narrow the range of feelings. Some emotions and or needs are deemed evil, wrong, or selfish. Not completely sure. Not completely sure in this one, honestly. Um, I can't say with certainty that this kind of thing took place. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if that applies. We'll give them a pass. Two, teach emotion stopping techniques to block feelings of homesickness, anger, or doubt. Not completely sure on this one either. It could just be the way it's worded, but... They were they were pretty straightforward about you know if you're sad then <laughs> then be sad you know it wasn't if you're angry yeah let's let's you know work on the root cause uh, if you have doubts let's work on the root cause they weren't really big on just stopping emotion completely so I'm gonna give them a pass in that category as well three make the person feel that problems are always their own fault never the leaders or the group's fault. Yeah, I could see that. I'll, I can make a case for that. So, certainly, blame is never placed on the feet of the church or leadership. If we have any problems, it's it was really aimed at the world, the devil, or our own flesh. And the the flesh was brought up quite a bit. To, to those that aren't familiar, there's a concept within this church that your spirit... Uh, can be attuned with God, but your human nature is always going to desire to sin, desire to uh, have sex and do drugs and do all these things that's not supposed to do. So yes, pinning these problems on your your um, human nature is very common. So uh, that's close enough. I'll 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 make a check mark at number three here. Going on to number four. Promote feelings of guilt or unworthiness, such as identity guilt, not living up to your potential, your family is deficient, your past is suspect, your affiliations are unwise, your thoughts, feelings, and actions are irrelevant or selfish, social guilt, historical guilt. You know, I would say, yes, this applies. There is certainly this weird duality to the apostolic Pentecostal message, and that is, you're the child of the king, you're this, you're a child of, of God himself, you know, he's, he is your spiritual father, but at the same time, you are considered this, this worm, you know, you're, you're a human, fallen human that has the sin nature in you, and it's always brought up that who you were before you came into the church was just, useless you know you were on the road to destruction before you showed up at church and you know who you hung out with was was always brought into question and it was very much 
a lot of a lot of guilt. I mean, and unworthiness. That that's completely right down the line what they were trying to sell because the only way you could achieve feeling of getting over that was to stick with the church, to stay in it, tough it out, and uh, maybe you could achieve something through the church. So yeah, I'll give that a check mark. Um, number five, instill fear. Such as a fear of thinking independently, a fear of the outside world, of enemies, losing one's salvation, leaving or being shunned by the group, or just others' disapproval. And I could definitely say instilling fear was something that they had uh, down pat. There was constantly this hammering of fear of the outside world. Um, The devil... Our adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion. He seeks whom he may devour. And as soon as, it was always taught that as soon as you stepped outside the church, you know, you were at risk of falling prey to this, this devil and, and the world outside. And there was this fear of going to hell and fear that you do the wrong thing, then you aren't right with God, and then he, he, the rapture happens and you're not ready. It was It was very much an atmosphere where fear was the primary bill of goods being sold. So, yeah, we'll give them a check mark. Number six is extremes of emotional highs and lows. Love bombing. Praise one moment. Declaring you're a horrible sinner than the next second. Um, sometimes public confession of sins. Um, indoctrination inculcating irrational fears. No happiness or fulfillment possible outside the group. Terrible consequences if you leave. Um, demon possession, incurable diseases, accidents, suicide, insanity, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's never a legitimate reason to leave. Those that leave are weak and undisciplined. They were led astray by a family member or you know, a college professor. They were seduced by... By a lover, sex, rock and roll, money. Um, so yeah, extremes of highs and lows. This is pretty much part and parcel with Pentecost. And that is, um, if you're a visitor and you walk in the door, by and large, you're just going to be mobbed by people that want to shake your hand. They want to get to know you. They want to just show you why this is the best choice you could possibly make. Um... It's definitely hammered into your head that if you walk out, if you are an apostate and you leave the group, that your life is over. Like, you will lose your job. You'll just bring curses upon yourself. And there was all kinds of fear sold on the people that that walk away. And certainly it was hammered into our heads that... The people that leave don't get what they left for. So uh, a girl gets in a relationship with a guy and she leaves the church to be with the guy. She won't have the guy by the time it's over with. Well, whatever, whoop-de-doo. Yeah, people commit suicide outside the church. Yeah, yeah, we we heard that a lot. So I'll give that a check mark. Um, So emotional control, four out of six. So to recap... Let's go over these categories. So behavior control, uh, I put about 12 out of 18. Information control, um, about 4 out of 6, I think. Thought control, 8 out of 10. And emotional control, about 4 out of 6. So overall, Church I Left ranked very high on the cult scale. Um... And I think a very, this was a very formal test, uh, for the most part. We're, we're just going by line by line, you know. It doesn't measure up to this very neutral, objective test. But a very informal test that you could conduct, and I have done this in the past, is um, you just tell somebody about your church. Uh, describe the day-to-day activities and the rules and so forth. Just, just give them the rundown. If somebody that has no experience with it, no connection with it, they happen to listen to this description and the first words out of their mouth is, "Eh, you came out of it, you were in a cult, dude. And 
you talk to 10 people and, and all 10 people say the same thing, then you're probably in a cult. And that's been the experience of myself and many others that have left is that's the first word people use to describe it. It was just like, hey, man, you're drinking the Kool-Aid, you know, you're in a cult. There was no deviation. That that was the immediate reaction that people came up with. It's just like, man, you're lucky to get out, you know. Or, And so I think to myself, why was it so difficult to see that? Why was it so hard to see that when we were in the middle of it? But that's just human nature. It, we accept our reality as normal when you, you're exposed to it for years at a time. Certainly, you're born and raised, and every day of your life, you're you're just neck deep in it. It's hard to see your way out. Some people do, some people don't. But I'm very happy to have finally made it out of there. I apologize for the length of this episode, but I wanted to get through that entire bite model in one sitting. Appreciate your patience listening, and um, hopefully we all learned something and was entertained by it. And that is all I can hope for. Thanks, guys. Oh, you can say it better than that. Say it again. All right, listen to the question now.